So fake news has become this very popular topic, but it's not as if the whole concept of fake news is new. We have all these things that have been around forever. I mean, even really old terms like yellow journalism and propaganda, conspiracy theory, newer terms like clickbait, um, alt news, half-truths, post-truth. We love all these things. But fake news, as we know in this political climate, has become very popular. Um, there's one article described it that uh, politicians have implemented a political strategy of labeling news sources that do not support their positions as unreliable or fake news. But there's a ton of stuff out there. So the first thing I have up here is a Facebook post. This appeared on my page. Somebody posted and said, I discovered 20 people, foreign, that were following me on Facebook. I knew none of them. They are now blocked. Go to your page, click on account settings, click on blocking, block users, and in the box type, type in following me and go. And then when you get this list of people, you have to individually block them. Well, that sounded insane to me. I have a pretty tight Facebook page. Um, but I went and I did it, and all these weird names showed up. And I thought, what is this? So I'm a librarian. I went, I looked, I got information. It's completely fake. Um, if you go and you do this, all Facebook is trying to do is find people not following you whose names or something about them closest matches following me. The sad part about this is the person who posted this is a fellow librarian who ought to know better. So I just want to say even we can be tricked. And in fact, just a quick side story, when Mei Ling and I were trying to decide to do a presentation here and what we wanted to cover, we were throwing around ideas of fake news. And Mei Ling sends me an article from the New York Times all about fake news. She says, this is a great article. There's a lot of really good information in here. I did what we all do when we get emails. OK, great, I'll take a look at it, and filed it. Later, on Facebook, I found a great article about fake news. I thought, oh my god, this is great. Typical, just read the title. I immediately shared it with Mei Ling, and I'm sure you can imagine what her response was. It's the same article I already <laughs> shared with you. So we know we are guilty of these things that uh, this colleague did as well. We share very quickly. We click too quickly. So fake news sometimes is entertainment. This is hard to see, but it's a picture of the Staten Island Ferry with an oct octopus around it. And this is a memorial. It's dedicated in loving memory to the passengers and crew of the Staten Island Ferry who were killed in 1963 when a giant octopus off of lower Manhattan reached up from the depths, grabbed it, and pulled it down. You can actually find this in Manhattan. It's a real live monument. And it gets moved around a lot um, because it is entertainment, which my students never understand. It also has a lovely website. And the website has really great information. <laughs> it has videos. It has news stories. Um, I mean, it's just incredible what students believe these days. And it just it looks good. They think it's real. Uh, other things, especially things that come across social media. If you've ever seen an article from WTOE News, 5 News, that's a completely fake news source. And I know that came across my Facebook feed at one point. And I was shocked. Pope Francis is endorsing Donald Trump. What do you do? You click, you share, you don't read the article. Even the FTC is getting in on this. And if any of you are taking those acai berries, um, for weight loss, I'm really sorry to tell you it's fake. <laughs> and the FTC actually had to send out a consumer alert and sued the companies for putting out fake news. I mean, even using the term fake news, fake news is getting used everywhere. Everybody's jumping on the term for something that's been around forever. So it's kind of depressing. In 2017, two-thirds of US adults get news from social media. I know I'm guilty of that. And it's not like we're getting well-rounded news on social media. I only follow things I like and that reflect my viewpoint. I only see one viewpoint on social media. So I can make this sound worse, and I can tell you that the 67% who get news is actually up 5% from the year before, so it gets worse. 
I can make it sound maybe not so bad. 20% say often, 27% sometimes, and then 20% hardly ever, the rest not at all. So it's not like everybody is getting this. So this is a quote from 1938 when War of the Worlds was over the radio and everybody thought we were being invaded from Mars. And it's amazing that all this many years later, it still applies. I am not afraid of an invasion from Mars. I am afraid of a non-intelligent public in a democracy. I think it still holds true. Oops. So, what's really going on? How confident are you that you can tell real news from fake news? And I know you probably can't see these, so I will tell you that about 27, 28% are really confident that they can tell real news from fake news. And then close to 50% are somewhat confident. So you have about 75% of people are pretty confident they can tell real from fake. So what happened when they were actually, ooh, whoa, everything's moving quickly. OK, here we go. That was fake news. So um, what happened when they were really shown fake news stories, and did they believe them? So I have five fake news stories, some of which showed up on my own Facebook page, including the Pope Francis shocks the world and endorses Donald Trump. And after 75% of the people said they can tell the difference, what we have here is 75% think it's real. That's really scary. It's even worse. Donald Trump sent his own plane to transport stranded Marines. I have to admit that didn't come across my Facebook page. Um, but yeah, they're believing all this one. This one I did say the FBI, FBI agent suspected in the Hillary email leaks found dead in apparent murder-suicide. I saw that. So people think they know, but they don't know. So there are a number of places where you can get help and you can look for news information and try to find out if it's real or not. When I saw that Facebook post about people following me, I went to Snopes. I find a lot of great stuff on Snopes. And it said, yeah, that's ridiculous. And it explained why in detail. And there's a couple of other sites. This isn't meant to be a complete list. There are other really good ones. Um, Hoax-Slayer is a good one. And there was one other one I don't use, but I just saw in this article. Urbanlegends.about.com is also another really good one. So there are places you can go to try to confirm information. There's also places that will show you if there's any kind of media bias in it. But at the same point, it's not like these are all managed by people you can trust either. Who do you believe? It is a real issue. For example, this ad. I was reading a magazine, and I found this ad. It says, have you been fooled by fake content? Yes, I have. And I just am trying to blow this up so you can see it. It says, 75% of us fall for fake headlines. We all deserve better. Fact is, people believe magazine media more than any other, whether in print, online, or mobile, or video. It provides expertly researched, written, and relevant content in a safe environment. That's terrifying to me. When I go and I teach undergraduate students, and I'm trying to teach them about scholarly literature and how it's expert, written by experts, expertly researched, I'm talking about a really complicated process of original research and peer review, I'm not talking about reporters who work for a magazine. And these ads, which people might be actually believing, is actually put out by Hearst magazines. This is who they're saying we should be believing. And I have to say, they have their own bias put into them. I was recently teaching an ethics of food class. And one of these right here, um, the Atlantic right here, an article showed up when I'm showing students about, uh, we're talking about junk food. And here's the article, how junk food can end obesity. <laughs> well, I wish it were true. But, you know, this is a pretty lurid headline. And you have to go and read it to find out they don't mean go to McDonald's and eat every day and you're going to end obesity because that's not true at all. And in fact, when I went to the Media Bias website, it even talked about how the Atlantic is left to center. And they talk about things they do like lurid headlines. 
to draw you in. Of course, most of us only read the headline. I don't know who else is guilty of that besides me. And by the way, it's not true when you read the article. I'm really sorry. <laughs> So what are some things that we can do? The most important thing is critical thinking. When I took the Staten Island Ferry Disaster website and I presented it to students, when I presented it, even telling them it was a fake website, when I gave them a checklist of things to look for, that website has virtually everything you would look for. It looks very well done. You would believe it. You can even buy stuff off of that website. Um, and it explains why you wouldn't have heard about it before. But when I took the same group of students and I said, put the checklist aside and think about it. Think about first, how big is the Staten Island Ferry? How many people can it hold? Imagine the size of that. Now tell me, how big is the octopus? And they think about it, like, that couldn't happen. We need to teach critical thinking skills. They have to stop and think about whether or not something can tr be true. We also, we all, need to read before we click or share. I'm horrible at that, but I know I can't just read the headline. And so many times I see this crazy headline, I click on the story, and it's different. It's not what I expected. When we teach evaluation, we do have to be careful of lists. They will go through and check off everything on the list. And that's what this quote talks about. Students think they can just go and do this very mechanical by rote, check off every item, and oh, yep, OK, it hit everything. It's good when it's not. So what we have, and it's on your handout. Did anybody not get the handout? OK. Is we have this much better list from the International Federation of Libraries or something like that. I can't remember what IFLA stands for. It says on the bottom of your sheet. And they talk about these things that you should look for. To first, consider the source. Where did this come from? Read beyond the headline. Who's the author? What else supports this? I love taking a story I'm unsure about, and I'll just go Google the story. I can go to a fact-checking website, but I can go see who else is talking about this, and what are they saying? Is there a date? Is it a joke? People don't know there are jokes on the internet. I feel like we have a whole generation of students coming up that don't have a sense of humor because they don't realize it. Uh, checking for biases and ask experts, librarians and others around who help people, even though sometimes we screw up too. We can also promote um, games and assignments to help our students. So first I want to show this game, Factitious. This is a website. Mei-Ling is going to click on it, and we pray it's all going to suddenly pop up. It's popping up. OK, we're going to do Quick Start. So if you click on Quick Start, and we get our first headline, Python gets stuck in Portland woman's earlobe. Wow. That's really, OK, it's a different one every time I look at it, and I do not like this one. So what do we think? Is this real or fake? I hear fake. So click on the red X. We are wrong. That is, that really happened. How do you think the size of Python? How can it fit here? How big is the here? Sometimes you got to go check it. Let's do one more. <coughs> Weasel apparently shuts down world's most powerful particle collider. So the Hadron Collider went offline because they found um, a furry creature had gnawed through a power cable. That sounds true, doesn't it? What do you all think? Let's go with the little green check mark. Is it real? Is it real? Yay. So it's just, it's a fun game. There are a lot of things out like that. Mayling, why don't we go back to the PowerPoint? Right. Go back. Can't go back anymore. They showed us. Just make this page small. No, here. OK. All right. So, um, and I had called up too, just in case it didn't work going back and forth because if you ever teach a class, you know your technology will not work on you. <laughs> so I had this one article, Pope Francis will focus on fake news, just to let you know that's real. And I also had the majority of American teens think that G7 is Google's <laughs> new smartphone. And I'm happy to say that is a fake article, although for sure I thought that one was true. 
So here's another assignment where you, the students need to do critical thinking about uh, an assignment. So they need to go find something, a website, a newspaper, a magazine that talks about an actual research article that appeared. And they need to look at the main purpose of the article, the key question, the research methods. So actually, here's something that happened to me that could demonstrate this. The Atlantic showed up on my Facebook post must have known because I read that, fa that uh, whole junk food article, so now suddenly the Atlantic is chasing after me. And I got the grim conclusions of the largest ever study of fake news. And here's this lovely article, lurid as usual, um, but easy to read, all about a fake news study. So then I went and I got the fake news study which is a scholarly study. It appears in Science Magazine. By the way, it came out March 9th, so I would have had more information in the PowerPoint, but the PowerPoint was due Thursday and this was published Friday. But the really interesting thing is here it talks about um, going through the article and the information. I think it's really interesting to compare the two because if you give students each of these, they want to read this one. They don't want to read this one. This one is scary. Look at this one. Look at all that stuff. Uh, it's, it's tiny little print. Um, but it is really interesting. And just as a quick aside from that, this article talks about a group that went through Twitter and looked at 126,000 stories over the past 10 years that were tweeted by three million people more than four and a half million times. And it found that false stories diffused significantly further, faster, deeper, and more broadly than true information in all categories of information. And the effects were more pronounced for false political news than for false news about terrorism, natural disasters, science, urban legends, or financial information. It's this really scary article. Um, scarier if you read it from the Atlantic than if you just read it from the original article. But it is really an interesting assignment to go and look through this and even just to do the comparison. Oops. So, right, that is part of it. And I just want to say where I got this assignment, Mei Ling's son had to do this for a class. So here's another one. This is the Uncle Bob example. So here's a tweet from Uncle Bob. In addition to winning the Electoral College in a landslide, I won the popular vote if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally. So it's an opportunity to talk to students about emotions. How does the story make you feel? What's your value system? How does this fit in with your values? How does it fit in with Uncle Bob's? How does this information compare to what you know about the topic? How would you evaluate it? And how would you fact check this tweet? And then finally at the end, why do you think Uncle Bob shared this and how would you respond? So it's really interesting to make this very personal. Um, not that everybody has an Uncle Bob. And there are plenty of other assignment examples. In fact, you can even go to Google and put in fake news assignments. You can have students find a fake news item, put them in groups, have them show how they would evaluate each item. And really the point of this is to get them to know it's out there and they need to evaluate information. You can also have students look at articles on both sides of a current debate, maybe climate change or gun control, have them look at the different types of articles for bias, and then have them decide how would they write an article to try to eliminate the bias. So there are a lot of things you can do with students to try to get them to know they can't just believe everything they see, especially the crazy headlines, and think before they click and share. Um, but we're going to take this a little bit further, and I'm going to pass this over to Mei Ling at this point, because she's got something even scarier to talk about. Really? I think so. OK. So you talked about fake news, and I'm going to talk about another category of fake news. And most of us would say, fake news, don't worry about it. As long as you don't go on Facebook, you know, don't look at 
those articles that Jill spent all this time. I don't know where she found all this time reading those articles. <laughs> but anyway, so you figure, you know what? We will just tell our students, go back to our scholarly journals. You know, something looks like this one. You have the title of the journal, title of the article. You know who the authors are. You know their affiliation and all that. Everything will be fine. You know, don't worry about the fake news. That's what I would tell Jill. Um, oops. Does it work? Yeah. Yeah. So can we trust it? So let's take a look at this article here. I'm going to blow up the affiliation here. This is the author's name. I don't know how many of you are Star Trek fans here. Oh, one of you. Wonderful. <laughs> so this is actually an article. The whole article, the story was based on one of the episodes in Star Trek. And somebody actually fabricated the whole thing, make it up. And um, actually, Simmerman is actually one of the characters in Star Trek. And also, if you look at the affiliation, I don't know about you, but I have never heard of this place called Starfleet Academy. And so if you look at this article very closely, you know that this whole thing is actually a fake article. So what is going on here? Um, I don't know how many of you have received this kind of email. If you're a professor or you, you're a researcher, and sometimes with if you have the uh, .edu email address, you may receive a lot of emails that will ask you to publish with those journals. And um, it's more like a buy a pair of shoes and get one free, you know. Um, this one, you can actually submit two articles, but you only have to pay uh, for the price of one article. And the price usually vary anywhere from $100, $150 to, let's say, thousands of dollars. So you write your article, you send it to this publisher, and then they will publish it in a very quick manner. Now, people get really upset with those spam emails. So actually, some researchers decided to create an article that looks more like this one. Um, <laughs> if you don't have glasses, I will read it to you. Uh, it says, get me off your F mailing list. That's what it says here. And the whole article was filled with the same sentence pretty much over and over again. And what happens was they submitted this article to the publisher and see what happened. And the publisher did not really use any human to review the article. They accept the article. Um, that was in 2005. And the, con the problem is the, 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 the spam email continues throughout today. And um, in 2014, another researcher, Peter Van Proo, and he decided that he's going to use the same article and then submit it to the, the journal called International Journal of Advanced Computer Technology. And guess what happened? It was accepted again and rated <laughs> excellent. <laughs> now, if you go to this journal, you would not be able to find this article because the author refused to pay that $150. But you can see pretty much whatever you can write, you can actually submit it. Somebody will actually publish it for you. Now, all these publishers, they actually do have some editorial boards. And this is one of the guys who, I don't even know how to pronounce his last name, um, Dr. Heidari, I think. Um, very handsome guy if you look at the profile here. And he's actually from California South University. How many of you, I know we live in New Jersey, but how many of you have heard about California South University? You have not? OK, so I have not heard about it either. That was two months ago, so I decided to Google it. Because you know what? If I can find that university website, then I know that it exists, right? <laughs> Sorry. So this is the university website right there. So somebody actually create the identity of the editor and also went extra mile to create a website for California South University. So do not believe what you find on the internet there. And this is the publisher, Omex International. Um, they have 2,000 employees in India right now. They put out thousands of journals out there asking you guys who are eager to publish with them. And if you look at the editors right there, they have a list of editors. Um, the funny thing is they did not even bother to come up with a different last names. It's all the variation of the same guy that we just saw earlier. So ooh, now I realize that this clicker, you cannot click it too fast. See, it wasn't just me. No, not just you. It's me. It's very gentle. 
So when you heard about predatory publishing, these are all pretty much the synonym that you will hear this day. Fake publishing, dark side of publishing, pseudoscience, global parasites. Why is it global? As I mentioned to you, one of the publishers like this is actually in some other countries, and they're also making a lot of money. The phrase predatory publishing was coined in 2010 by a librarian, actually. Um, his name is Jeffrey Bill, and he created something called Bill's List. Unfortunately, um, about a year ago, the list was taken down by himself. Um, it was t told that he was under a lot of pressure from his own university, so he had to take it down. And uh, he was also sued for a million of dollars by the publisher as well, unsuccessfully, but he also had to, you know, pay some lawyers to defend him, so it was not a pretty situation. Right now you can still find his list, but it's not really being updated very regularly, and, um, but you can still find it somewhere. Somebody actually managed to um, get the list and archive it. Let's see if I can play it. Oh, I really cannot. Do, do, do. Okay, so one thing I really want to emphasize is that a lot of people confuse predatory journals with open access journals. I want to make sure that you understand that these two are not the same. It's just some black sheep out there, they take advantage of the open access movements and so they try to make money and so you know publish journals with us, pay us the, the fee and then we will publish your articles um, without any really proper peer review process. So I don't want you to think that these two concepts are the same. Um, it's just some black sheet out there that was taking advantage of the open access movements. Okay. So we talked about all these fake ideas that the publishers have created, and I want to tell you another story about the Sting operation. This one was actually published in New York Times last year. Um, this lady, her name is Dr. Sust. How many of you here speak Polish? I don't speak Polish. But it turns out, Sust, now you will know this Polish. It means fake. So this person, this lady, looks beautiful here. And her last name is actually Dr. Fake, in a way. <laughs> so what is going on here? Uh, what happened was there was a sting operation. A group of researchers decided to send this profile to a list of publishers and see <coughs> if they would accept her as one of the editors in the editorial board. And here's the result that was published in the Nature Journal, which is a very prominent journal. And what happened was, among the predatory titles, about 33% of those titles accept her as the editorial uh, board member. Directory of Open Access Journals, which we usually call it white list, they also list all these open access journals. About 7% of them also accepted her as the editor. Now, the last category are those journals that are indexed in Web of Science. Those journals, none of them, zero of them, actually will accept her as the editor. So I just want to show you this chart here to, see, to show you the differences among all these three categories here. And those predatory journals, basically, they just get whatever they want, they will publish. So if you think that there's a Martian you know, who's coming here to Rutgers tomorrow, they will still publish that article. So I just want to recap the history here. Traditionally, we have traditional publishing that has been making over $2.6 million of business every year. Now I'm talking about the major publishers here. I'm not even talking about the small society publishers. This is a big money-making business. And then in 2002, we have the open access movement, which provide the opportunity for publishers like Omex, which was founded to take advantage of these author paid article processing charges. In 2016, the US government noticed this, the problem. So FTC actually accused Omex of engaging this thing, deceptive academic publishing practices. Now that was 2016, you think things would get better. Well, what happened is 2017, we just looked at that example of Dr. Seuss who 
try to apply to be an editor and actually got accepted in 33% of the journals. And today, we have about 8,000 predatory journals in all disciplines. So this is an, actually a very scary situation right now. Fake news, in my opinion, I think we can still try to you know, examine and try to investigate and say, you know what, those are the fake articles. We don't need to, pop, uh, we don't need to believe it. However, when you come to the scholarly journals, it's so hard to see the truth here. So there's a lot of ethical issues here. I'm not going to go into detail, um, but if you're interested in it, you can read this article. For those of you who are interested in publishing, I would say stay away from the predatory journals because you're going to waste your time, waste your energy, waste your research um, money. Because once your article is published in those journals, it will be almost impossible to retract. And then you will always be associated with one of those predatory journals. So here are some red flags here. How can you tell if a title is a predatory journal? Number one, a very similar title. Preventive medicine is published by Elsevier, a very important scientific publisher. Another title, Journal of Preventive Medicine, is published by Omics. So you will see a lot of journals are like that. Very, very similar titles. And they usually will add the words Journal of, International Journal of. So you have to be very, very careful and make sure that whenever you see those titles, check and see if this is actually published by some you know, traditional publisher. And also, you will see that you will have a lot of spam emails that will get sent to you. So if you see those emails, stay away from those publishers. Very quick turnaround time. For most scientific publishers, the turnaround time for an article, do you know how long it will take once you submit your article? Even social sciences, make a guess. Let's say you submit your article today. How long do you think you will see that article actually appear in a journal on average? Six months. Six months? How about you? What do you think? Five years. <laughs> <laughs> Not that long. Um, for science, it's about 29 weeks. Social sciences is about that neighborhood as well. So you're really talking about about six months or so. So can you imagine that the turnaround time for these publishers is usually within days? So they also publish anything pretty much with little or no, I don't know, 10 minutes left. With little or no peer review. And again, as I said, there's no retraction policy. And the journal website usually are filled with a lot of errors. So right now, the predatory publishing is filled with these three categories here. One is the victims. So we have a lot of young researchers at their early career. They just want to publish. And they don't really know what kind of journal are out there. So they publish in those journals, and they become the victims. We have sting operations that we just saw earlier, all those articles that were created by the researchers just to you know, see what happens with those publishers. And what really bothers me the most is the last category. Those people who know those are the predatory publishers and they still submit their articles to those journals. And last year in October, there was a very interesting article in New York Times talking about many academics are eager to publish in those journals. So why do people do that? Well, because many people who are on tenure track or up for promotion, they have this pressure of you know, whether you should publish or perish. So you have to have that citations on your resume. You have to have that citations or five articles you know, before you get reappointment, reappointed or something. And then also, there are a lot of scholars in other countries. They may think it will be very difficult to publish in Western journals. So whatever journal they will accept their paper, they will go for it. And of course, there are also some, publish some scholars who are not aware of the situation. And that's why we are here to talk about this predatory publishing to raise the awareness. 
So these are the tips which I also put them on the handout. So if you have a copy of the handout, you can look at it. Number one, do not publish in those journals, okay? I don't know, I don't care how desperately you want to have that listed on your resume, it's not a good idea. And number two, whenever you are in doubt, check the directory of open access journals and see if that title is listed there. And number three, check journal <coughs> impact factors. We actually have a subscription to journal citation reports here at Rutgers. If you do not, if you're not affiliated with Rutgers and you do not have access to journal citation reports, you can also search CiteScore, which is a free uh, web page put out by Elsevier. So I list those links over there so you can actually take a look at it. And also the other one is check this. Okay, be careful. Check this Think, Check, and Submit website. This is a fantastic website. If you're not sure whether the journal that you want to submit your article is really trustworthy, you can go through this website and follow the steps. I also have some tips for the students as well. As a professor or as an instructor, you know, tell your students that really it's a good idea to search the, the library databases. Even though it's not 100% you know, foolproof, you will have fewer chances to get to those predatory journals. The other thing is always verify the study, just like what Jill did earlier. You, know, you always try to find out if that study has actually been published or not. And finally, try to do site of reference search. Site of reference search is a very important technique. It helps you to find if any other articles have referred to that article. And there are three databases there, Scopus, Google Scholar, and Web of Science. All those three databases will allow you to do site of reference search. So let's say she wrote a paper, and I will be able to find out if anybody else has referred to her paper. OK. So this thing either works really yeah. well, doesn't work. So finally, I just want to show you this screen here. This is about the octopus. Since Jill is so interested in octopus, I decided to join her, her effort here. Um, if you have seen the news, they have this soft robot arm nowadays in like uh, places in fast food restaurants that can do the flipping burger thing for you. So even if you want to find a job in McDonald's, it's not that easy anymore because they have a soft arm that can actually flip the hamburger. This thing here is uh, a soft arm robot that is inspired by octopus. So if you read this article by itself, how do you know if this is a fake news or not? Well, if you go to Scopus, you'll be able to find out that this article actually has been cited by 12 documents. So we have selected some other references for you in our slide. I know that our slide will be on the web later on for you to download. You can actually read some of these articles if you like. Mm -hmm.